Okay, good day, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Blaze Connected Construction Series. Today, we'll be addressing a very important topic, which is the fact that we have a very low R&D culture in the building construction industry. And today, I have a guest that has vastly experienced in when it comes to research and application of IT in the construction industry. So today, our guest is Dr. Zufi Kadamu, who is an Associate Professor of Strategic IT in Construction at London South Bank University in UK. So his expertise revolves around leveraging computing and data-driven tools and processes to enable digital transformation in the architecture and UN construction industries. The research and practice that includes building information modeling and digital engineering, where his focus has been on Autodesk Ventricis ecosystem and the underlying Forge API for managing <coughs> work and multiple data streams. Integrating BIM with GIS systems through data-driven processes as well as developing ETA workflows from multiple data sources. So he has experience with computational modeling and simulation of buildings using dynamo beam, computational fluid dynamics, dynamic thermal modeling, and digital training, as well as connected beam. <coughs> and on to this is also into 3D certified serious gaming developer when it comes to VR and AR, through which is developing VR-based training games for health and safety, fire evacuation, and also People's workflow for project monitoring. So he's exploring the use of drone acquired data for VR construction data analytics. And he has been using Python programming for data science and also for artificial intelligence and machine learning purposes, federating beam data with GIS and data driven workflows, as well as analytics dashboard and using Python ArcPy library for GIS for creating bespoke plugins. So he also enjoys, of course, database and working with data programming using MongoDB and SQL. He has knowledge and skills in the use of blockchain technology as well for the supply chain in the AEC industry, particularly IBM's Composer. Lastly, he thrives on seeking innovative ways of making data and digital technologies improve productivity for design and construction, as well as delivering optimum value for clients and end users in our industry. So this includes <coughs> upskilling, training and development of bespoke workflows and solutions for a fast changing industry. So he is not saying that Dr. Zufika Adam is highly experienced when it comes to strategic application of IT in our industry. So join me today to welcome Dr. Zufika to this show. How are you doing, sir? Uh, thank you very much. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm great, sir. All right. Yeah, so welcome to this edition of this series. So, of course, today we'll be talking about the increased need for research and development in the AEC industry. So, of course, before I start, I've done some brief introduction about you, but I would also like you to tell us a bit about your work in the industry, your research work in the industry, especially as regards your current capacity as an associate professor of strategic IT and construction at London South Bank University. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, in order to understand what I do, uh, both in academia and industry, I think it's better for me to maybe summarize some of the things you've said about myself uh, in a way that will make sense. Um, I'm an architect by training, and uh, I got my big tech and M-Tech in architecture, and um, but I went to specialize in uh, related fields like um, architectural engineering, where I got another MSc and PhD in civil and building engineering from Loughborough University in the UK. So um, along the way, uh, you know, as you go higher in research or in, in academia, you try to specialize. And the area that I specialize in happens to be the use of IT um, in, in, in construction industry. Now, as an associate professor, uh, my work, uh, people might think, oh, yeah, he's a teacher, university lecturer. Actually, teaching is just a small fraction of what I do every day. Most of my work at this level as an associate professor is focused on research and enterprise work and in all those areas that you mentioned, beam, virtual reality, and the rest of that. You know, um, so that's that's what I do, and and uh, like I said, I I do enterprise as well as uh, research, and the research that I do tends to be applied research. I do enterprise work where we do go into things that might be regarded as product development uh, or consultancy and the rest of that for those who are in industry. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So obviously, you are involved in a whole lot. Uh, one of the first things I would like to. For you to address is you no know, there's this recent report from the New South Wales. So in the 20, 20, 2021 industry report on the utilization of design and construction of class two buildings in New mm -hmm. South Wales. That, according to that report, close to 40% of firms in the build sector, the building construction industry, on average spend less than one percent of their annual turnover on R and D activities. So mm -hmm. why do you think there is currently a very weak R and D culture when it comes to practice in the build sector? And what do you think can be done about it as well? 
Okay, um, in order to make it a very context specific answer, and this will be probably the bulk of what I'll be talking about today. Why is there you know, minimal uh, uh, application of R&D in, in the built environment uh, industry? Um, first of all, I think I'd like to clarify to the audience that there are different kinds of research. There's basic research, which is usually very theoretical. Uh, you just want to explore something for whatever reason, and that just creates, okay, we know this material can do this kind of thing, or this material is used for that. Um, but there's applied research where you actually try to use that knowledge, existing knowledge from basic research to apply it to specific use case scenarios. Okay, so and then the next level probably you go into R&D where you are, you're not only doing research for application, but you actually have a specific problem where you're actually going to end up with maybe a product development or a service. So you end up developing a product or a service as a way of enhancing your, 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 ex, your, your organization or producing a new solution for other people to use. So you might be doing R&D to boost your capability as a company, as a firm, whether you're designing or contracting, or you might be doing it for to, to you know to sell a product, you know what I mean? You to sell a service to other people, you know? So <clears throat> but back to the question asking, why do I think we have uh, about 1% of the annual turnover is spent on R&D? I think in order to understand this, we should look at it from the lens of the barriers. What, what are the barriers that organizations are facing in the AAC industry? And some of these barriers I would like to talk about apply to both developing and developed countries. But for the context of this uh, podcast, I think it may be better I contextualize it with developing countries because I think that's where most of your audience are based. So that would make a lot of sense. So it would make a lot of sense if I'm always talking about what's happening in the UK or the US or Europe and stuff like that. <laughs> so I'll say that in summary, <clears throat> about six or seven or uh, eight barriers I'd like to talk about. First is the consumerist nature of the built environment, the built industry. We're very consumerist based, and I'll explain this in detail. The second is that we have this lack of problem-based approach to doing research, you know. And thirdly, we have ignorance about innovation and poor leadership. And that is, there's also, fourthly, the cost of R&D, it's also another barrier. And then there's also lack of in-house expertise, you know, for many organizations, they just don't have that expertise, even if they have the money. And then we have also um, monotonous, or what I call tunnel vision way of doing research in, in our own sector. Because when we say our sector, our built environment sector, we are broken into two categories. We have the academic sector, subsector, and we have the industry sector. Those of us in the um, in the academic sector, some of us have this tunnel vision way of doing research where you have a BSc in architecture, you have an MS in architecture, you have a PhD in architecture. Clearly, everything you'll be doing is kind of limited because you know you have this one way of thinking. You know, might have quite a few skills here and there, but you like to see people branch out and get more expertise in other areas. And then um, finally, I will talk about also the lack of uh, protection for intellectual property. When you do R&D, you end up developing new products, new services, and that's intellectual property that needs to be protected. So one of the barriers is that if you don't, Feel that your investment in your research will be protected by law so people are going to just use your product and service for free why would you want to go into that you know what i mean you're not unless you're a charity organization you know what i mean so um so yes. let's take a, let's take a look at some of these uh, barriers in detail the first that i talked about is consumerist nature of buildings now you know building uh buildings in general they, we utilize a significant amount of r d actually we utilize it but these r d products and services are from other industries we are very consumerist think about your paints it comes from chemical industry or, or material science. Think about your HVAC system, your boilers, your photovoltaic cells. You know, th these, these are from electromechanical uh, industries. You know what I mean? So yes. the very consumerist nature of our industry means that because we have off the shelf things we can just buy and apply in buildings, we there's the incentive or the, you know, the motivation to do research is not really easy. You know, it's not uh, plain and, and, and apparent. You know, it requires a lot of uh, traction or momentum to get people going. Having said that, you know, one of my favorite architects when I was a student of architecture is Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. We call him the architect of steel. He was a German-American. He, he said something in the 19th century, I think, uh, or late 19th century. He said, uh, when technology reaches its apex or its climax, it transcends into architecture because we are creatures of habitat. Of all the creatures in this world, we are one of the, those who actually design our habitat. Well, birds can make nests. You know what I mean? And and some and some uh, other animals can dig holes in the ground, but we properly design our buildings in a very sophisticated way. So we end up applying a lot of technology and science and development into our buildings because we spend 90% of our time in buildings. It makes a lot of sense. Having said that, we, we have a situation where uh, when a company says we are being innovative, what they're actually saying is that we are using somebody else's innovation to do our work. You know, you might be using a smart toilet or smart WC you might be using some building integrated photovoltaic cells. These are not products of the construction industry to a large extent. Maybe some builders, were, uh, construction people are involved or designers, but largely these are 
products that are meant by uh, produced by other um, subsectors, other industries, which we then apply and use. How many times have you seen architects getting involved in the science and research of floor finishes like paint or, 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 or sorry, wall finishes like paint or stuff like that? Not that it cannot be, but you know, a lot of times we leave it to other people to do it and then we apply it. So that that sort of consumerist nature is one important barrier that um, that has uh, uh, more or less affected people's uh, ability to uh, utilize R&D in the subsector. And if I was to talk about all these barriers, it would not be helpful if I don't talk about the uh, solutions. And I think the solutions is that firms need to start thinking that, look, we don't have to do bread, bread and butter. The architectural firm, a quantity solving firm, you don't have to just be doing measurement and uh, cost con contract management all the time. You can engage in other kinds of things that can add value to your work, give you more clientele or provide service to others, like I said. For example, take a typical QS firm right you they can they can diversify into areas of data science you know they can build expertise because qs by nature they deal with quantities and and, and numbers and things like that they have to do with buildings so they're very good in that area and when you when they delve into the areas of data science they perhaps can start to provide you know innovative solutions especially by going into this digital age everything is becoming digitized the designs that we create the buildings that we construct sensors and devices everywhere all this data that we're getting it needs people to analyze them and to to utilize them so that's one way a QS firm, for example, can break out. An architecture firm, for example, can say, you know what, we can branch into uh, some sort of maintenance aspect or retrofitting or refurbishment because as architects, we understand buildings, why they work, how they're put together, and that could be a way of um, differentiating themselves. But they need to do a bit of research. You can't just wake up, be an architectural firm, and decide to go into maintenance. What makes you different from the average plumber out there? You have to be research driven, be able to come up with innovative solutions um, going forward. So that's the first barrier. The second barrier I would like to talk about is the, I think we have generally in both academia and industry in the construction sector, there's lack of problem or product based uh, research to a large extent. You know, a lot of times you find people doing research, but it's almost driven by some nice sounding title or aim, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, what is it? What's going to come out from that? You know, I mean, for academic reasons, yes. Research can be done just to generate knowledge. That's one good reason to do basic research and sometimes applied research. But research and development requires you to be able to produce innovative solutions. You have to be able to come up with something that solves a specific kind of problem. So in many cases, for example, in some branches like building or civil engineering, you might find in academia, in academia or building environment, you find people uh, coming up with titles like the use of fly ash, cassava leaves and fish bone in the, uh, certainly the capillary capacity of reinforced concrete that has been infused with bamboo sticks. I mean, it's wonderful. It sounds interesting in terms of the title, but to what end? These kind of research are not old, they're not they're not useless, but you know we need to start to think about pro problem and product driven uh, research so that uh, and this can be led by universities and, uh, and and the rest of it. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not for companies alone to do it because research and development is not only going to happen in industry. Okay, so that's one thing. I think. And the solution to this is that the academic school supervised researchers, like pe people who do MSc dissertations or PhD theses, they need to be driven towards thinking about practical problem reality-based solutions that can be used and so that when those people graduate they have transferable skills that they can actually go and solve real world problems not wait for somebody to solve a problem and then you apply it and say you you are, you are innovative that's not innovation innovation means leadership means by this nature innovation means somebody hasn't done it that way before it's new you know it solves a problem in a new way okay <clears throat> the third barrier i think will be something i'll say ignorance and uh, poor leadership because um when, when do you have an industry where your leaders are not very uh, aware of the potential benefits of going into R&D, you know? And they don't have that vision. They don't have that understanding of the role of innovation. Then you're not going to have R&D uh, successfully implemented. You know, this is about innovation diffusion to an extent, you know? And no matter how much you have professionals in a company wanting to do R&D, if the leadership doesn't share that vision or doesn't even lead from the front by allocating funds and money and time and in-house training, you're not going to make any progress. You know what I mean? It's, so that leadership is really required. It, cannot, it can really be a bottom up. You can imagine few professionals coming up with some research ideas and trying to shove it down the throat of management. You know, it's, it's, it's better that the management provides a platform so that they encourage people to be creative, to come up with solutions to, to problems. You know what I mean? So and, and in terms of sure. uh, yeah, solution to this approach, I think that first of all, organizations um, in the construction industries need to start to think about allocating certain funds, you know, for R&D. Maybe it could be a percentage of each consultancy fee that they end, you know, and then it should go into a pot for R&D. In addition, they can be supported by government through incentives and subsidies. For example, you can give uh, companies tax incentives for, for doing going into R&D if they can provide evidence that they're actually doing R&D, 
so they can get their corporate tax slashed by certain percentage, which would be nice, you know, so because we, some of our organizations, especially in the constructing side, have operated at a very low profit margin. And you tell them to take, uh, in, in a project, they might just get a few percentage of the cost as profit. So um, how much can they afford to, you know, uh, divest and, and redirect into uh, research? But when they get tax breaks, there's no excuse not to be able to use it for research, especially if the government says this 5% tax reduction should be for R&D. Of course, the company has to be able to meet some certain criteria, like you have to be of a certain type or size or have some capacity to demonstrate to us that you are going to use this money well. And that'll be, of course, monitoring. It's not enough to make policy if you can't monitor and implement it so that it works well. Related to that, there's also lack of in-house expertise. No matter how big an organization is, it needs to build that in-house expertise such that they can have like a, a unit that they can dedicate to R&D. Even they don't have a dedicated unit, they can hire people who have research experience, PhD holders. You know, people think like PhD, when you do PhD, you're going to go and teach and do research in the in university. That's just one out of many things you can do with a PhD. You know, if someone does P some, some, some exciting research, let's say on low energy buildings or zero carbon buildings or whatever, sustainability, and he, he, he's an architect and he opens a consultancy firm, I expect his buildings the product that he delivers to his client to be different, to be outstanding from just another typical roadside architect with all due respect to roadside architects. You know what I mean? Because there's a reason you do research. You are able to explore things in a way that people are, don't even know that that kind of thing can be done. You know? So your companies need to think about hiring more PhDs. In, in the West, UK, Europe, uh, North America, large companies are starting to do this. But, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be just that you have to be large. It could be medium-scale industry or uh, um, company. Or you could even hire some of these people on a part-time basis, you know? You don't have to hire a PhD holder because yes, they'll command some significant amount of money. But if you hire them on a project by project basis, on your research by research basis, it means you don't have to have that big overhead that you're worried about. You know what I mean? And so some of the things you can do with this sort of people is, if you can't hire them, you can also go into what we call knowledge transfer partnerships, where, okay, you can work with a university that has people that have expertise in this particular area of construction, and you can do some joint projects that can lead to specific solutions to your organization, which will give you a competitive edge. Okay, and some of these companies can also decide, you know what, we have this brilliant MSC holder who has been with us for five years. He seems to be interested in, in, in energy efficiency. Why don't we sponsor him to do a PhD? You know what I mean? And even give him a topic so he doesn't have to just go and do a PhD and start exploring the use of cassava leaves in reinforced concrete or concrete or something like that. You know what I mean? So, um, so they come, and it's happening in many parts of the world today, in, in Asia, in Europe, and North America. In fact, in the UK, we have used to have something called the engineering doctorate. It was a doctorate degree that was often sponsored by industry who will bring in their candidates um, and they will solve a problem that will be used by that company. If I intellectual property, in many cases, some of their thesis is not even published because there's no point them investing in this kind of thing and then everybody gets to see the result the next day. So um, those theses are closed sometimes for up to 10 years or so. Sometimes they're closed forever. They're never disclosed to the public. Okay, so that's how you can build in-house expertise. The next barrier, I think, has to do with academics who are specialized in research. We have this uh, sort of monotonous or tunnel vision way of building our expertise. You know, you are an architect. You do a BS in architecture, MS in architecture, PhD in architecture. That's not a bad thing. But, you know, if you really want to contribute into innovative solutions, you have to be able to have other capabilities, which you cannot easily pick by being a typical architect every day. You have to branch out into building services, into sustainability, into even civil engineering, you know, construction management, cost engineering. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. One of the problems we have with academics not doing that is that in some countries, uh, and Nigeria is one of them, if you are an architect and you do a PhD in civil engineering, the Department of Architecture is not going to touch you with a long pole because they feel, no, you're not an architect. That's nonsense. You know, you don't need all. Uh, well, I'll give an example. In architecture schools, you have graphic and freehand sketching lecturers who teach you modules about sketching. They are not architects. Why don't you bring architects to teach those things? You need experts in graphics to teach graphics to architecture students. You know what I mean? So um, what I'm trying to say is that we need to think about how the um, university systems uh, in certain countries are churning out people who only have monotonous way of thinking about research. If you can do research in only a monotonous way, the opportunity to be innovative is drastically reduced. If you don't have expertise, I'll take myself as an example. Why I'm able to do what I'm doing today is because apart from being an architect and I'm still an architect, every day I see myself as an architect, I'm able to, you know, do certain things in architecture engineering, all these computational modeling and things I do is because I branched out, you know, and I'm loving it, I know. So uh, so there has to be a, a cultural change, you know, and, and in, in the way universities uh, who, who produce the bulk of PhDs, who hire a lot of them in the way they view uh, people with expertise. They should not see them as people who are outsiders. As long as you have a fundamental skill or, 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 or background in that area, let's say your country surveying department, 
can hire somebody that first of all has a BSc, maybe MS in two years, but his PhD could be in sustainability. Why not? His PhD could be in data science. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, if you think about, let's say, an urban planner, why do you want to do BSc? I mean, you can't do a BSc and MSc and PhD in urban planning, but think about it. If you are an urban planner and you do a PhD in, say, remote sensing and geography, imagine the kind of skill sets you're going to bring in. Not that you cannot do a bit of remote sensing and urban planning. You know what I mean? But imagine also if this urban planner is interested or working with people who do resettlement of people, mass resettlement, maybe due to climate change, maybe due to things like uh, internally displaced people due to conflict. If he did his PhD in human geography, for example, don't you think that this person has that capacity to come up with solutions as a planner in a way that an average planner would never be able to even consider some of those solutions because he understands the human aspects of geography and stuff like that. So this is why universities need to be able to branch out and be flexible in the way they, they encourage their staff to go for further uh, terminal degrees and hire people who already have those degrees. I'll give you a very good example. When I was doing my PhD, one of my mates, one of my colleagues who started just a few weeks apart was a sociologist. Yet he was doing a PhD in civil and building engineering. And people might say, oh, wow, that's, that's weird. But in the UK, this sort of thing is encouraged. This guy is not really a built environment person. He's a sociologist. He understands people. But his research, you see, was about understanding human behavior when it comes to energy efficiency in residential buildings, looking at things like demographics, age, weight, gender, you know, uh, income, and all those things. How does that affect the way people use um, appliances and, and the way they consume energy? That can only be done by a sociologist. No matter how brilliant you are as a, as a building engineer or whatever, um, you probably struggle to understand the people's side of things, which is why that, that, uh, my, that colleague of mine was able to do his, um, his PhD in that area. And, and he, he came up with some very brilliant uh, results at the end of the day. So that's a multidisciplinary research, more or less. There was also lack of protection of intellectual property. You know, uh, when you do research, you spend money, you spend time, you come up with a solution or product or a service, you need to have the government or, you know, the, 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 the regulations that will support your ability to exploit that to the fullest. But when you come up with intellectual property as a new product or a new service, it doesn't mean you use it yourself. The intellectual property rights will give you the ability to command licensing fees. Companies that want to use that product or service can pay you a licensing fee or they give you a royalty. You know what I mean? It depends on how you how the whole thing works out. But that gives you even a, 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 a new income stream as an as organization. You know what I mean? You do R&D and you make income from your intellectual uh, property. And then finally, I think I'll just add this. I think one barrier also is unwillingness to fail. Many, many companies want to do R&D, but they are not prepared to fail. And unfortunately, you cannot do R&D without a kind of startup mindset. You no, know, people who do startup companies, they, they know that it's not everything they will do will work out well. They're prepared to fail. If fact, failure is very important. Even the business person will tell you he learns more from failure than from success because you learn a lot of things that don't go right and you make amends about it and you learn new things along the way. So when you think about R&D and you're not prepared for some losses or to hit, you know, to, to make some losses along the way, you're always thinking that whatever money you sink in must generate a uh, profit, then you have the wrong kind of mindset. So we need to inculcate a sort of startup culture, which is why I said some companies that want to do R&D can set up small units in their companies that more or less behave like a startup company. You know, we are an architectural firm, but we want to branch into this area of data science or facility management or robotics in construction. And then you hire a few people who can try a few things, you know, buy them a few equipment, give them the incentive, the motivation, and you'd be surprised what they'll come out. It might take three, five years, sometimes more, but they'll give you something that um, will stand out, which is uh, an innovative product. So I hope that, that has answered the question about uh, why there's uh, no little R&D or not much, as much R&D in the built environment sector. Recently, there was a building collapse in Ekoi, Nigeria, with a lot of casualties. And that's not the first of its kind in Nigeria and other parts of the world. How do you think incidences like that can be uh, curbed by R&D in construction? Uh, that's an interesting uh, question, actually. Now, uh, without you know, trying to go into the details of the particular collapse that happened in Lagos recently, I mean, let's just ha have some theoretical you know, exploration of to, as to why did this building collapse? Now, there's some possible causes. One could be structural design that was poorly done, more or less professional negligence. So that's one thing. Another reason could be environmental issues. It could be about something about to do, uh, the soil conditions being unpredictable or you know, something going wrong with the uh, whatever, the, 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 the substructure or the whatever, you know, so environmental issues. Um, another reason could be maybe the contractor was trying to cut corners or the client was, was trying to save money and as well as the, the compromise on the quality of materials. But another reason I could think about that could make a building collapse would be why maybe sometimes some companies rely so much on technology. Like, you know, many structural engineers, for example, will use what we call finite element analysis 
to simulate structural design of a building. When you over rely on some of those uh, tools and software without being able to interpret and understand their results, you may end up having some um, very poor application of the structural design. So I'm just, first of all, trying to lay the foundation to say that there is a lot of reason that could have led to that collapse. I don't know which is the reason. Okay, it could just be a matter of people just breaking the law or whatever. However, when you think about how uh, R&D could have solved that problem, I'll take a simple scenario, okay? You know, we have something called cyber-physical systems. These are systems that combine physical products and virtual products into a seamless process and, 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 and platform where you're able to interlink between what is physically there versus what is virtually there. And some of the ways this has been used nowadays in building environment um, is like digital twins. We have things like digital twins. The roots of digital twins actually is about physical system, which is used in many other industries. So let's take a building, a typical building, a place like Lagos, like structural. There's a lot of reasons for applying cyber systems or digital twinning, such that you maybe, for example, you use sensors. You have, imagine if you have sensors that were embedded into the concrete columns of this building, which means these sensors may be a one type of multifaceted sensor or different type of sensors that can monitor everything from the vibration, they can monitor excessive loading, they can monitor moisture ingress or, or rusting of the reinforcement, they can do all, they can collect all even temperature and humidity of the ambient environment. And this will give you real time data about what's going on with that structure, even during construction. It doesn't have to be after construction. So that when there's any vibe, because buildings don't just wake up and decide to collapse. Usually something will happen in a gradual way and you're not noticing it until it becomes, it gets to a critical point of failure and then it fails. So, you know, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that um, there's opportunity to do research in, 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 in things like CPS and digital twinning such that we're able to monitor buildings in terms of, uh, you know, using sensors and all that. Who will benefit from this? You can imagine like the, the, the state or national, let's say take the state government, like Lagos state government, for example. And the, I'm sure they have some building control body, whatever, that approved, you know, the design and construction of a building, you know, a high rise building, of course. <clears throat> so yeah, if as part of their, if as part of their <clears throat> mandate, they're, they're requiring certain buildings. If a building has a certain height, let's say from 12 or 15 floors and above, or if a certain building carries a certain load or certain function, or if a certain building is a particular location, maybe close to the coast or whatever, or where there's certain risks, then there's a requirement to have some sensors that feeds data to those both the designers, the contractors, as well as the building control bodies, so that we have a way of um, understanding what's going on with the building, even 10 years, 20, 50 years into its uh, lifespan. You know what I mean? And some of the sensors that can be embedded inside the concrete, by the way, you know, they are very you know re resilient and they can last decades. So that would be a very good way of uh, being able to. Uh, Quality control, you know, is quality control and health and safety issues of, of construction work. So, uh, but you can't just go and buy these sensors of the shelf and the next day you have a cyber fiscal system. It requires a lot of research because there will be buildings of different types, there will be structural systems of different types, location, and, and all those sort of things. So, companies can think about specializing in this area. It's an emerging area that I think uh, can be very beneficial for a place like Lagos that almost seems to record a building collapse every other year or, or every year, in fact, nowadays. You know what I mean, they, they tend to be very fatal and, and, and um, very catastrophic. So hopefully, I, I don't know if that has answered um, that question. You, you, you dropped off a bit, so I, I, I took the initiative to ask, ask the question and answer yes, it Yes, on, on the recent collapse, yes. Yes, so, on recent yeah, obvious, collapse. Obviously, yeah, that's, obviously we can see the importance of research. And like you've mentioned, the importance of such things as digital twins and having, you know, the cyber physical system, the digital version of what we have in, in the physical world. Yes. So obviously, like you mentioned, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done uh, with regards But that's just to that's just one example, uh, you know, yes. because you, as you specifically asked about the building collapse, which is a contemporary issue that many Nigerians will be interested in. But there are other aspects in building services, maintenance, energy efficiency, uh, zero carbon, um, and, and so on and so forth, you know, even issues of, uh, of, of health and safety. Doing construction itself, there's a lot of opportunity to do research, especially because we have a lot of technologies that can allow us to collect data because you cannot do research without data. Okay, so we collect data, yes. you can analyze that data and, um, and and apply it in a very interesting way. One challenge we also have as an industry when it comes to R&D concerning this data is that I think we are too information driven. I, I used to I have this phrase, I say we are on the information simply slope or the simply slope of information. We are driven by graphics and information. What, what do I mean? You know, when people, I hope people understand the difference between data and information. Data is your spreadsheets with columns and rows of numbers and all those sort of things. Information is when you produce a pie chart or a bar chart out of that. So we are driven by graphic information or either by graphic models, but sometimes we need to look into the core data, like those sensors I talked about, 
those will give you data about what's going on. They're not necessarily going to give you bad charts or whatever. You have to now apply that and see. You know, the same way that earthquake, earthquake industry, uh, it's not an industry, where the earthquake sector of, of maybe infrastructure industry or maybe, for example, landslides, people have sensors in the soil that tell them, you know, when there's some tremors, when there's movement in the soil, and they can prepare for, for, for landslides. They do research into this area and, and make people safer, make, save lives, save property, you know. Um, so this is just what I'm saying, that I think uh, if people start to think more data-driven, this will encourage them to do research and apply data in very innovative ways rather than produce, use, you are not relying on information that comes out of a design graphic software. That's that's already processed, but sometimes you need to be able to go and collect your own data. Sometimes it could be using drones or robotics or, 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 or some other uh, uh, um, data loggers of some sort. And, and it could be at different phases of the building, by the way. It doesn't have to be at the construction phase alone. It could be at the design stage. It could be at the post-occupancy stage. You know, It could be at the demolition stage. You know, There are many phases of a building life cycle that research can be, uh, and development can, can be very useful. So I'll, I'll let you move yeah. on to the next question now. Yeah, thanks a lot for all the insights. Obviously, you've mentioned a whole lot of things. So but in your opinion, what are some emerging trends in the industry or even that have not even emerged that you feel that are worth investing research money on? I know that you've already highlighted quite a number of them, but mm. what if, if someone attends this program and the person wants to know, okay, I've understood the importance of R&D, what are those areas that I should actually focus my money on? What are those trends you okay. feel like are very important in the industry? Okay. I could talk about this. I could answer this from an individual perspective or from an organizational perspective, you know. Um, but I probably want to focus on the organizational level. So if a, if a firm is thinking about going into R and D of some sort, you know, it depends on their interests, depends on opportunity. You don't do R and D just so that you can have that uh, bragging rights. Hey, yeah, we have an R and D department. No, you're trying to solve a problem. You're actually trying to make money by solving a problem. All companies that make money are solving a problem or the other. That's that's a fact. Okay, so uh, the areas I'll think about in the built environment will be include maybe things like um, smart materials. They're emerging quickly and they can be very, very useful in many ways. Uh, I can think about robotics and some aspects of automation in construction. Um, there's also build information modeling. Everybody's, a lot of people are aware about BIM now, but it doesn't mean BIM is a finished thing. And we, can, we can continue to do more research into how BIM is used and, 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 and giving companies a competitive advantage. There's also virtual and augmented reality, VR and AR, uh, we have smart buildings themselves and digital twinning. There's also data science and machine learning. And of, of course, there's also smart cities because that this is a new uh, thing going on right now within the last decade or so. Uh, but smart cities need smart buildings and smart infrastructure. So uh, it all, all trickles down to uh, the level of the organization or individuals that are involved in creating these buildings that make cities smart. So these are some of the areas I think are uh, easy, low-hanging fruits that one can a company can decide to venture in there. Other more specialist areas, I don't want to go into them now. You know, those areas could could, could be some anything to do with um, energy efficiency. You know what I mean? Um, yes. Carbon emission, carbon emissions, reducing carbon emissions, and, and, and other areas like offsite construction. You know, yes, offsite construction is, is, is not a new thing. It's been going on for decades now. Uh, it's becoming more efficient and cheaper. Uh, but if you think about it, the way it works in developing countries is is a different ball game. If you want to use it in a country like uh, Nigeria or Ghana or South Africa, that's that's not going to be a matter of just simply transferring the the hardware or technology. And no, you have to look at social cultural issues and the technology and the whatever capacities that people have, and even the the cultural uh, nuances that can come into play. You know, uh, because you're not going to import foreign prefabricated buildings into Africa or Asia. You're going to have to do your own buildings that will serve, serve your own cultural and environmental needs and stuff like that. So those are those are areas that I think um, are ripe for expo exploitation by any company wanting to do venture into R&D. And you don't have to start big. You don't have to start thinking, oh, I've got a budget uh, 20 million uh, Naira or $50,000. You can start small. Start with one part-time PhD holder who will look into one area, maybe interested in finishes and surfaces. You want to specialize in that area, for example, as an architecture firm. Get someone who has a PhD in material science and explore how you come up with innovative finishes for walls. Maybe like using smart materials, for example. You know, and gradually you can see that you, you can come up with you know exciting ideas that are ripe for further exploitation. Then you can start to grow the team around this person, or you know, even use what we call knowledge transfer partnership to work with universities to further explore this. Of course, you're going to sign your NDAs to make sure that university does not steal your idea and go and publish it in the paper. Because once you publish research findings, you cannot patent it. It, that's the thing. So you cannot do that. So when you go into R&D, be careful. You don't just talk to people about your ideas. You have to make sure you sign your NDAs and, and the rest of that. Okay. 
and uh, you when you get the products you need to invest in patenting them of course or the service you can patent them and in fact if you look at some companies they make a lot of money from patenting and licensing that they barely even bother about create using the products themselves you know they market their, their services the ips and make money from royalties and licensing in yeah, fact so one strategy okay. that's used just a quick one one strategy that's used by some companies especially in telecoms is that they actually develop um ip intellectual property not because they need to use it but it's actually a strategic way of uh, pushing down their competitors i'll give an example two competing telecoms company mobile telecommunication company one is in asia one is in north america i'm not mentioning names they will come up with a lot of ips you see they have a lot of ips patents and stuff like that they're not using all of it they're either licensing it to other comp competitors which means tomorrow they can say no we're not licensing this anymore and that competitor's product is in trouble maybe it's a specific kind of camera or a specific kind of navigation system you know what i mean or hardware yes. so they've now held their competitors down because they refuse to give them a renewal of the license <laughs> or some cases they actually develop some of this IP in order to make sure that they'll just wait until their competitor has tried to use that kind of IP idea. Because they have a patent, they wait maybe two, three years down the line, they take them to a court of law and sue the living daylights out of them. <laughs> or sometimes they just, they know that this is an interesting area. They're not ready to go into it yet, but they get the IP to R&D and then nobody else can do that. You have to come to them to get that license and they'll say no. So they've held you down. Or they can use that breach of ip to hold you in the court of law for years while they are busy making progress in one area so you can see that rd can actually be a competitive tool to cause a lot of damage to your competitors you know what i mean <laughs> yes all right okay yeah thanks a lot for the you know you've mentioned a whole lot of areas that companies can venture into and also some smart ways to make it over and the one last question i have for you is you know earlier you mentioned about the whole lot of research going on in in the academic sector mm. or in academia generally so how do you think you can begin to bridge this gap between because there seems to be a whole lot of research going on in the academic sector in comparison mm. to the industry so how do you think you can begin to bridge this gap between academia and industry so that you can maximize the use of all this mm. research going on in academia and ensure that this research actually translates to practical application in the industry okay i think one easy way to do it is uh, where well, there are quite a few solutions or approaches but one will be going to knowledge transfer partnerships with universities where you have this kind of framework and arrangement where the university that is able to do more research can do a lot of research and transfer it to you through ktp or knowledge transfer partnership in many cases like in the uk what happens is that a company will have their staff embedded in the university for a certain number of months or they alternate between industry and practice and they're more or less building their capacity to to do research and to apply that research in a practical way because the industry person uh, who is deployed or embedded in the research uh, uh, university knows the problem of the of the company. The university is just good at doing research. They might not necessarily know what's best for that particular company. So that's one thing. KTP is uh, very helpful. I think also we need to think about um, industry-funded research. I'm not talking about government-funded research because when government gives research in some countries, it's like giving them this academics handout money to just go and blow into research that they will publish in a peer-reviewed journal that will have 10,000 citations and so on, which doesn't really mean much. Architects don't read journal of um, infection control when they want to design the next hospital. They don't read journal of structural engineering when they are in structural engineering when they want to design the next building. You know, so you need to think about how companies can fund the research that can help them you know, get that competitive edge and get that innovative uh, uh, edge uh, to that will, that, will, that will make them successful. So industry-funded research, you can think about the big companies funding research into universities, not waiting for government to throw just, yeah, okay, here's a research grant, go and explore the use of fly ash and cassava leaves and concrete, you know? When, when a company funds that money, that, that research with their money, they want a solution they can use yesterday, not even today. So there's no room for you to start doing any kind of um, research that is neither here nor there. So that's the second way. I think the third way will be the companies themselves, uh, organizations in the, in the industry can think about sponsoring. I mentioned this earlier, sponsor PhDs in universities and or even hire PhD holders. You know what I mean? If a country uh, could go into doing engineering, a university can go into engineering doctorate, that would be very uh, ex exciting because it would be a kind of focused doctorate degree that is built towards a pro problem or product uh, uh, based solutions rather than just applied research for journal publications and then finally i think i think about um the stakeholders this will include the universities the companies the government you need to think about creating research and innovation hubs or research parks you know which is it's a it's kind of environment like incubation centers where these stakeholders can meet up and set up you know uh 
um, maybe um, startup companies or research and R and D companies that actually exploit some intellectual property in a way that will solve problems and and, and, and create profits for those companies. You know, this would be a healthy breeding ground for, for companies, especially to dip their, their tools into uh, research without having to set worry about setting up R and D in their own company in their own premises where they cannot even control what the researchers are doing. Maybe they don't even know what the researchers are doing. But if you have this platform, uh, research parks, then you, uh, many universities in the UK and Europe have this in, in North America as well. Um, then they, this is a breeding ground for a lot of times startup companies emerge as a collaboration between industry and academia. I hope that um, answers the question. Okay, so let me see some of the comments here if I can, if there, is there any question there? Somebody say building industry 4.2 is also an emerging trend in the built environment. Yeah, but that's just all part of fiscal systems and IT and driven world, you know. So it's not industry 4.2 is not unique to the building industry, but it's a, it's a very good point. Someone says failure of building regulation structure, failure driven by development client, or whatever. Somebody says this discussion is coming at a very good time, but I personally believe it needs a bigger audience and should be done in seasons, elongated. Okay. So that means we should do this part two of this. <laughs> uh, kudos <laughs> to organizers and thank you, Pro, for taking time out. You're welcome. Another person says, kudos to organizers. It should be a series of events which can give knowledge to project managers and construction managers about how R&D can drive industry. Okay, I think that's, that's that could be, we could do a series of, of R&D in construction. Okay, we'll have to think about that. Uh, Hassan says, lots of insightful points. R&D requires a lot of funding beyond leadership and creativity. Yes, I've mentioned that already as a barrier. If you cannot throw fund money at research, you're not going to go far. Uh, but where does money come from? So tax breaks, I, I've talked about as one way of ensuring companies have a way of um, of sponsoring research. Uh, not to be lost here, somebody said, can I know the meaning of R&D? That's research and development. Uh, Beniza, <laughs> R&D means research and development, okay? It's not just about research, it's about developing a product or a service that's uh, as an outcome of that research. Somebody says R&D collaborations among institutions and industry players can be incentivized or support through competitions. That's true, uh, it can happen. Uh, like Kaggle have made this possible in data science industry. That's true. Uh, one other option I'll say, apart from is, is competitions, rather than have competition, you can have, uh, and I've participated in a lot of this, uh, hackathons, you know, if, if you're into the IT side of things, that is, you can do hack, organized hackathons. Um, maybe that's something we could think about doing in one of our series going forward, where we can take a problem by a particular type of industry, sub sector in the construction industry and organize the hackathons and get people from IT, um, and product development and uh, design and construction, all the stakeholders generally to come in from teams, develop something as a solution, which can be uh, applied. For example, if, if, if a company is sponsoring Dangote, for example, if Dangote is listening, I'm encouraging you, Mr. Dangote, to throw some millions of dollars along the way so that we can organize a hackathon to help you, you know, exploit um, the better use of cement in very cost effective way to de develop digital twins or whatever. <laughs> anyway. Um, Ayodeji Alunda says, I'm not in. Okay, that's not a comment. Uh, okay. Yeah, just uh, to also add to, just also add to the issue of uh, hackathons. It's also important mm. to mention you know, Beam Africa today have um, uh, a research department or more like an R&D department that also mm. tries to do a mm. number of research. So it's also, I guess, a lot of time it's been stored. Uh, the research has not really been as active as it can be, even be because of issue mm. of funding and, and, and yes. things like that. So this is also where you know, raising funds to promote all those research around digital transformation across the continent can also come in very handy. So mm. anyone that is listening in that might also help out in that regard can also mm. you know, always get in always get in touch as regards okay. that. So there are no questions from our audience apparently. They're all just making comments. Okay. Okay, yeah. Forget. Since there's no question, I'll just go ahead to ask the random questions I normally ask beyond the discussion. So outside yeah. of the discussion. So the <laughs> okay. first the first question I have here is if you had to summarize yourself in one sentence to a total stranger, what would that sentence be like? You just summarize yourself in one sentence. How what would that sentence be? Is it a compound sentence or a <laughs> <laughs> okay? Well, one, one, one sentence. Okay, one sentence. I, I would describe myself as as an architect who can think and function like an engineer. I'm a chartered engineer, oh, okay. all right, but I don't see myself as an engineer per se. It's just something I just feel is important for professional development and all that. And my PhD is actually in building engineering, but fundamentally I'm still an architect. So whatever I do is geared towards uplifting the profession of architecture. I'm just doing my own little bit in my own way. Okay, that's obviously a compound sentence, but it's fine. No, I, I answer, that was, <laughs> it was followed by an explanation. I said the, the oh, answer is okay. that I'm an architect who can think and function like an engineer. That's how okay. I describe myself. Yes, yeah, that's okay. That's that's fine. Okay. That's great. Okay, the second question I have, what's your favorite hack or two? You know, something that eases your work or your life. It doesn't have to be in the industry. Just a favorite tool that you find very 
the tools I have, I won't say they've eased my life, but they just make it exciting. You know what I mean? My favorite will be, I think I have two favorites. First is computational fluid dynamics. Especially because of my PhD, I was able to do research into airflow modeling and simulation. So CFD, computational fluid dynamics for modeling and simulating ventilation and indoor air quality uh, is, is one of my favorites. And the other will be Unity 3D, which is for virtual reality and augmented reality development. I, I do something called serious gaming, which is like, you know, the game that you know, you know, like the PlayStation games, uh, 3D video games, but, or sorry, computer games, but not for entertainment. Here we use them, when we say serious gaming, we use them to solve problems. For example, one of the first, people don't know this, one of the first serious games that ever existed is Flight Simulator. When you go to a Flight Simulator, you are like driving a real plane, even though you're not in a plane. So it's a game that teaches how to land and take off planes and all those sort of things. So, but in construction, okay. uh, I, I, I use serious gaming for for things like health and safety research and, and, and stuff like that. So how we can make buildings um, safer during construction. You know, for example, uh, a construction site, we can model that using VR environment and simulate things going wrong. How do we keep people safe if there was to be a, a, a problem, a fire, even sometimes partial collapse. So uh, maybe there's a conversation to be had with the uh, Lagos State government, if Sam Wulu is listening, that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I will have, we still have a couple of minutes left, and it seems uh, some questions came in. Yes, sure, so, sure, sure. Yes, so this is from BC Illumina. He's asking, how does one go about collaborating in this area? How does one go about collaborating in this area? Maybe in R&D? Ah, oh, that's, that's an interesting one. That's a pregnant question. If it starts giving birth to children now, I think we'll have uh, octopulets or something like that. I think, first of all, you need to have the, 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 the leadership in both the academia and industry wanting to exploit R&D. I think it will be very risky and very difficult for a company that has never done R&D to just start like that. It can be done if you have the right mindset and you have the right kind of resources to expand on it. But if a company can go into some sort of a partnership, it could be a KTP to start with, with university. If imagine something, a company like Julius Berger or, or something like that going to partnership with Unilag or Nile University because they want to improve, um, you know, they, 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 they want to improve the durability of the asphalt they use in, in their road works or something like whatever, you know, then, then they, 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 this, the, the, the department in charge can, you know, help them, you know, uh, come up with the right kind of uh, uh, resources, types of the skilled expertise they have. And they, they, of course, the company will have to sponsor, you know, the research materials and all those sort of things. Um, but of course, having that partnership will be helpful so that um, they can regulate each other. You do, the university will not be doing research that is just geared towards new knowledge, new knowledge. The company will be interested. No, but this doesn't. How does this help us, you know, build cheaper, more durable roads? You know what I mean? You see a lot of people doing exciting works like there's this lady, I've forgotten her name right now, and, and there are quite a few people around the world doing something similar, using uh, recycled plastics, you know, recycling plastic like uh, sachet, what's, uh, this sachet water that you have in Nigeria, pure water, you know what I mean? So yes. you're getting a lot of that and converting them into paving bricks. That's interesting, but you know, that kind of thing ideally can be driven by R&D. It's not about just mixing, melting plastic and making, uh, there, there, there's, there are a lot of ways of optimizing it, expanding its use, because the last thing you want somebody to use those sort of um, plastic pavings in, let's say, paving an area that might be susceptible to fire, for example, that that could have some 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 consequences. Now I don't know much about the plastic paving, uh, recycled plastic paving, but you can imagine that um, it's the, the, there's opportunity to really really uh, make use of this, not just even for uh, paving, even for cladding and finishes and stuff like that. That's why you need to do research. And that lady who's doing those, those wonderful things could not have done this without doing her own research. She didn't just wake up and pour uh, sachet into a bucket and started melting it under a, a charcoal fire. You know, there's a lot of work that went behind that and she needs to be commended and supported. I mean, companies can hire her, that kind of person, and I think I'm marketing, I think her name is Intisa or something like that, can hire that kind of person to, uh, to work for them as an outsourced expert or even full time, you know, pay her enough money and she can embed her company in yours. But I think she probably wants to be independent. And we need to see this kind of creative people being independent. And but I I just hope it will continue to grow whatever she's doing in terms of research, in terms of further development. Because that's just one way of using those kind of um, waste plastics. Okay. Yes. And someone is asking if this is recorded. Yes, this session is automatically recorded. It's a LinkedIn live, so you can always come here to watch the session but beyond that we always process this and make it available on our online academy 
I'm trying to paste the link. I'll still paste it, but if you check the comments, you see where I answered you. You see the link there. You can just visit that link. All the previous episodes and upcoming episodes are processed. After a couple of days, if you visit that link, you'll be able to see it and watch it again. So there's and, another uh, question here. Uh, somebody saying, okay, uh, you, cl you clearly have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, would like to see more webinar discussing practical applications of IoT, that's Internet of Things, uh, research and development in the built environment. Okay, I think we already think about um, yeah, that's so to, this to organize that to think about. Yeah, so this is a bi weekly series, something we do every two weeks. So basically, the idea is to invite thought leaders, both from academia and the industry, to discuss issues. Of course, it's more or less centered around the African built industry because we believe mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. So, of course, in subsequent episodes, perhaps we're also looking at making some of these sessions, panel sessions, so that we can have as many diverse inputs as possible. So, mm -hmm. Of course, in the, in the future episodes, from what we've seen, people are interested in this topic, so and mm. some of the topics that have come out of it. So we'll look at yeah. that and definitely. So you can always follow up. We also have a newsletter that accompanies this. So every two weeks, we also write an article that supports the topic of the day. So if you mm. check my profile, you see, if you check my last, my second to this, this post, you see the article and the newsletter. So at the end of that newsletter, I always announce the next session that I'll have. So just check it out. Every every other week, mm -hmm. and we have another last know. question there. Okay, what are the stumbling blocks to the transition of AEC Industries product to the factory floor? As I believe this will speed the throughput and drive down general cost. Oh, okay. Perhaps okay, maybe maybe like offsite construction, maybe like offsite and yes. fabrication. Okay, there are many. There are many. That's a very interesting question that I've been looking at uh, in sort of uh, on the sidelines. You know, I think that there are many barriers to uh, the, or, or stumbling blocks, like you say. One thing is that you see when you want the reason we want uh, the rationale behind offsite construction is that you want to mass produce things, mass produce buildings if you can. Because the difference between manufacturing and construction is that in manufacturing, if you take a product like this pen or this mouse, you design once, you know what I mean, and then you mass produce it, and the, every mouse you are guaranteed will come out the way this one comes out, and the cost and everything can be controlled, and you can make profit over the turnover and everything like that. In construction is different every building tends to be unique and a lot of times it also depends on handcrafts and people's manual skills so we're trying to move away into standardization so that um uh, we can mimic we can mimic manufacturing if you like now herein lies the problem it's can it can work in many cases where you can standardize components like doors and windows and hvac systems but there are some barriers i think like in housing delivery where you see housing or construction of buildings in general it's a unique industry that combines engineering and art the art side of it is where the aesthetics come into play. If I asked you to build, a, to design your own house, you want it to be unique, to be different from everybody's house. For it to be unique, it means your your components are probably, and the shape of the building will probably be unique. So there's a there's a clash between the need for creativity, especially from architects, and the need to standardize components. You don't want your house looking like everybody's house in that town. If you have mouse housing, you know that's a different thing. This can be helpful, but. Even architects themselves like to be able to be creative with, uh, with the way they produce mass houses and stuff like that. So there's, as I say, balance that needs to be struck between the creative issues and the standardization issues. But more importantly, I think the technology to do off-site construction is not uh, something that has it assists well with uh, what we do in, um, in in developing countries. You know what I mean? Uh, even in developed yes. countries, they're still struggling. It's not like uh, if they could just mass produce houses, there'd be no housing shortage in England, for example. But there's an also awful lot of house, housing shortage for whatever reasons, you know? Um, so there's quite a lot of work. And some of these things are not just about money or technology. Sometimes there are cultural issues. Sometimes there are social issues involved. There are political issues involved. This is why you need to do research. So when you do research, r and is not always about the hardcore product or service. Sometimes it's the, 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 the contextual issues, you know? That that can Sam Olu, for example, as a governor of Lagos State, might be interested in this thing I talked about cyber physical systems and, and digital twins for buildings that are from 10 floors and above. But you know, there could be other issues. People he's a politician, you know. He, they're, 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 he, at the end of the day, he wants to be voted back into power or his party wants to be in power. You don't want to now make a policy that all high-rise building owners will now refuse to vote for his party or whatever, you know, and then you now have a problem. You know what I mean? Or it could be things that uh, you cannot guarantee the maintenance of all those things. So this is why we need to um, think about research as a holistic way of solving problems uh, between industry, academia, and all those sort of things. A question comes in, it says, 
the starting point for SME firms to seek R and D collaboration with schools. I think an SME can do one thing. You can go to a school, like if you are based in Lagos, for example, you can go to Unilag. Maybe if I assume you have a problem, don't want to do R and D because you want to have an R and D tag on your company. You have a problem that you want to solve. You can go to a department in, in say Unilag, for example, and organize a competition of some sort for masters or PhD students or probably master students, for example, to start with, to come up with a topic on in a particular problem area. And you can be part of the jury, select the right topic, and you fund that master student's research to come up with a solution to that problem that you identified. Of course, that you need to support that student, not just with money, but access to data and other things that will actually solve your day-to-day -day problems as an SME. You know what I mean? I think that's one. Why am I using master's? is a low-hanging fruit. The master's students will typically finish his research within one or two years. You can easily um, be engaged in the process. PhD is a much bigger pie to swallow, you know, especially because PhDs can take forever to finish in Nigeria. I don't think any SME wants to wait uh, seven to 10 years for <laughs> their results to, to, to be out. So I think that's that's what I would suggest as a starting point. And when you that master students finishes, that's a good opportunity to, to hire that person. You know, hire them into your company. Yes. Maybe as part of the funding, he could be required to sign an agreement where he works for you for two, three years so that he doesn't just do the results of the research and walks away to go and work for another company <laughs> who benefit from his expertise, you know? Yes. Right. But yeah, thank you very much for the insights. I can see a whole lot of comments here. Uh, people have learned a lot from the yeah. from the session. So obviously, we'll still look forward to setting up a subsequent edition to still expand on some of the issues we've discussed. Let me just also, I'll make one last comment, please. Okay. Somebody okay. is saying the need for housing, I believe, is more pressing than it need to be different. For example, protecting the manufacture of laptops. You cannot compare laptops to houses. Everybody doesn't mind if they use the same iMac or iPhone or iPad or, or HP. But many people see a house like an artifact, something that they own, that like your own dress. You don't want to wear the same dress with everybody, but you don't mind using the same headphones with everybody. So there's that. That's Definitely. why I talked about the aesthetics, uh, the artistic aspect of housing or buildings in general that makes some designers and even the clients demand uniqueness. Everybody, if they had their way, they want their house to be different. That's why it comes into conflict with the need to standardize. So it's now for architects to think about standardize using standardized components or sub assemblies to create creative solutions rather than standardizing everything that every house looks like every other house a school looks like a church a church looks like a, a factory a factory looks like a school you know uh, you yeah i think that. i think maybe the components of the buildings can be standardized and not yes the it's, entire... it's, it's happening already uh, but again yes. it's uh, how we use it in the real world yeah. right thank you very much for your time yeah thanks a lot and we really appreciate obviously this is a lot of wealth of knowledge that have been built over several years of experience and learning and all that too it's really great to have you in the house today. And also thanks to everyone that attended and people that also dropped one or two comments and questions. It's great to have you. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, this is something we do every two weeks. So in the next two weeks, we also have another one or two thought leaders come on to share their experience, their words of knowledge from their, you know, their years in the industry. So thank you all and thank you very much. I look forward to having you in a subsequent episode. Uh, you're welcome. Um, I'm looking forward to being here again some other time. All right. So thank you. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, sir.